William Shakespeare, baptised 26th of April 1564, died 23rd of April 1616, was an English poet and playwright, widely regarded as the greatest writer in the English language and the world's preeminent dramatist. He is often called England's national poet and the Bard of Avon, or simply the Bard. His surviving works consist of 38 plays, 154 sonnets, two long narrative poems, and several other poems. His plays have been translated into every major living language and are performed more often than those of any other playwright. Shakespeare was born and raised in Stratford-upon-Avon. At the age of 18, he married Anne Hathaway, who bore him three children, Susanna and twins Hamnet and Judith. Between 1585 and 1592, he began a successful career in London as an actor, writer, and part owner of the playing company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, later known as the King's Men. He appears to have retired to Stratford around 1613, where he died three years later. Few records of Shakespeare's private life survive, and there has been considerable speculation about such matters as his sexuality, religious beliefs, and whether the works attributed to him were written by others. Shakespeare produced most of his known work between 1590 and 1613. His early plays were mainly comedies and histories, genres he raised to the peak of sophistication and artistry by the end of the 16th century. Next, he wrote mainly tragedies until about 1608, including Hamlet, King Lear, and Macbeth, considered some of the finest examples in the English language. In his last phase, he wrote tragicomedies, also known as romances, and collaborated with other playwrights. Many of his plays were published in editions of varying quality and accuracy during his lifetime, and in 1623, two of his former theatrical colleagues published the first folio, a collected edition of his dramatic works that included all but two of the plays now recognised as Shakespeare's. Shakespeare was a respected poet and playwright in his own day, but his reputation did not rise to its present heights until the 19th century. The Romantics, in particular, acclaimed Shakespeare's genius, and the Victorians hero-worshipped Shakespeare with a reverence that George Bernard Shaw called bardolatry. In the 20th century, his work was repeatedly adopted and rediscovered by new movements in scholarship and performance. His plays remain highly popular today, and are consistently performed and reinterpreted in diverse cultural and political contexts throughout the world. Section 1. Life. See also the main article entitled Shakespeare's Life. Early Life. William Shakespeare was the son of John Shakespeare, a successful glover and alderman, originally from Snitterfield, and Mary Arden, the daughter of an affluent land-owning farmer. He was born in Stratford-upon-Avon and baptised on the 26th of April 1564. His unknown birthday is traditionally observed on the 23rd of April, St George's Day. This date, which can be traced back to an 18th century scholar's mistake, has proved appealing because Shakespeare died on the 23rd of April, 1616. He was the third child of eight and the eldest surviving son. Although no attendance records for the period survive, most biographers agree that Shakespeare was educated at the King's New School in Stratford, a free school chartered in 1553, about a quarter of a mile from his home. Grammar schools varied in quality during the Elizabethan era, but the curriculum was dictated by law throughout England, and the school would have provided an intensive education in Latin grammar and the classics. At the age of 18, Shakespeare married the 26-year-old Anne Hathaway. The consistory court of the Diocese of Worcester issued a marriage licence on the 27th of November 1582. Two of Hathaway's neighbours posted bonds the next day, as surety that there were no impediments to the marriage. The couple may have arranged the ceremony in some haste, since the Worcester Chancellor allowed the marriage bans to be read once instead of the usual three times. Anne's pregnancy could have been the reason for this. Six months after the marriage, she gave birth to a daughter, Susanna, who was baptised on the 26th of May, 1583. Twins, son Hamnet and daughter Judith, followed almost two years later and were baptised on the 2nd of February, 1585. Hamnet died of unknown causes at the age of 11, and was buried on the 11th of August, 1596. 
After the birth of the twins, there are few historical traces of Shakespeare until he is mentioned as part of the London theatre scene in 1592. Because of this gap, scholars refer to the years between 1585 and 1592 as Shakespeare's lost years. Biographers attempting to account for this period have reported many apocryphal stories. Nicholas Rowe, Shakespeare's first biographer, recounted a Stratford legend that Shakespeare fled the town for London to escape prosecution for deer poaching. Another 18th century story has Shakespeare starting his theatrical career minding the horses of theatre patrons in London. John Aubrey reported that Shakespeare had been a country schoolmaster. Some 20th century scholars have suggested that Shakespeare may have been employed as a schoolmaster by Alexander Horton of Lancashire, a Catholic landowner who named a certain William Shake Shaft in his will. No evidence substantiates such stories other than hearsay collected after his death. London and Theatrical Career it is not known exactly when Shakespeare began writing, but contemporary allusions and records of performances show that several of his plays were on the London stage by 1592. He was well enough known in London by then to be attacked in print by the playwright Robert Greene. There is an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you, and being an absolute Johannes factotum, is, in his own conceit, the only shake scene in a country. Scholars differ on the exact meaning of these words, but most agree that Green is accusing Shakespeare of reaching above his rank in trying to match university-educated writers, such as Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Nash, and Green himself. The line, Tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, parodying the phrase, O oh, tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide, from Shakespeare's Henry the Sixth, Part Three, along with the pun, shake scene, identifies Shakespeare as Green's target. Green's attack is the first recorded mention of Shakespeare's career in the theatre. Biographers suggest that his career may have begun any time from the mid-1580s to just before Green's remarks. From 1594, Shakespeare's plays were performed only by the Lord Chamberlain's men, a company owned by a group of players, including Shakespeare, that soon became the leading playing company in London. After the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1603, the company was awarded a royal patent by the new king, James I, and changed its name to the King's Men. In 1599, a partnership of company members built their own theatre on the south bank of the Thames, which they called the Globe. In 1608, the partnership also took over the Blackfriars Indoor Theatre. Records of Shakespeare's property purchases and investments indicate that the company made him a wealthy man. In 1597, he bought the second largest house in Stratford, New Place, and in 1605, he invested in a share of the parish tithes in Stratford. Some of Shakespeare's plays were published in quarto editions from 1594. By 1598, his name had become a selling point and began to appear on the title pages. Shakespeare continued to act in his own and other plays after his success as a playwright. The 1616 edition of Ben Jonson's works names him on the cast lists for Every Man in His Humour, 1598, and Sayanus, His Fall, 1603. The absence of his name from the 1605 cast list for Jonson's Volpone is taken by some scholars as a sign that his acting career was nearing its end. The first folio of 1623, however, lists Shakespeare as one of the principal actors in all these plays, some of which was first staged after Volpone, although we cannot know for certain what roles he played. In 1610, John Davis of Hereford wrote that Good Will played kingly roles. In 1709, Rowe passed down a tradition that Shakespeare played the ghost of Hamlet's father. Later traditions maintain that he also played Adam in As You Like It and the chorus in Henry V, though scholars doubt the sources of the information. Shakespeare divided his time between London and Stratford during his career. In 1596, the year before he bought New Place as his family home in Stratford, Shakespeare was living in the parish of St. Helens, Bishopsgate, north of the River Thames. He moved across the river to Southwark by 1599, the year his company constructed the Globe Theatre there. By 1604, he had moved north of the river again, to an area north of St. Paul's Cathedral, with many fine houses. There, he rented rooms from a French Huguenot called Christopher Mountjoy, a maker of ladies' wigs and other headgear. 
later years and death. After 1606 to 1607, Shakespeare wrote fewer plays, and none are attributed to him after 1613. His last three plays were collaborations, probably with John Fletcher, who succeeded him as the house playwright for the King's Men. Rowe was the first biographer to pass down the tradition that Shakespeare retired to Stratford some years before his death, but retirement from all work was uncommon at that time, and Shakespeare continued to visit London. In 1612, he was called as a witness in a court case concerning the marriage settlement of Mountjoy's daughter, Mary. In March 1613, he bought a gatehouse in the Blackfriars Priory, and from November 1614, he was in London for several weeks with his son-in-law, John Hall. Shakespeare died on the 23rd of April 1616, and was survived by his wife and two daughters. Susanna had married a physician, John Hall, in 1607, and Judith had married Thomas Quinney, a vintner, two months before Shakespeare's death. In his will, Shakespeare left the bulk of his large estate to his elder daughter, Susanna. The terms instructed that she pass it down intact to the first son of her body. The Quinneys had three children, all of whom died without marrying. The Halls had one child, Elizabeth, who married twice but died without children in 1670, ending Shakespeare's direct line. Shakespeare's will scarcely mentions his wife, Anne, who was probably entitled to one-third of his estate automatically. He did make a point, however, of leaving her my second best bed, a bequest that has led to much speculation. Some scholars see the bequest as an insult to Anne, whereas others believe that the second best bed would have been the matrimonial bed, and therefore rich in significance. Shakespeare was buried in the chancel of the Holy Trinity Church two days after his death. Some time before 1623, a monument was erected in his memory on the north wall, with a half-effigy of him in the act of writing. Its plaque compares him to Nestor, Socrates and Virgil. A stone slab covering his grave is inscribed with a curse against moving his bones. Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear, to dig the dust enclose it here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Section 2. Plays. See also the main article entitled Shakespeare's Plays. Scholars have often noted four periods in Shakespeare's writing career. Until the mid-1590s, he wrote mainly comedies influenced by Roman and Italian models, and history plays in the popular chronicle tradition. His second period began in about 1595 with the tragedy Romeo and Juliet, and ended with the tragedy of Julius Caesar in 1599. During this time, he wrote what are considered his greatest comedies and histories. From about 1600 to about 1608, his tragic period, Shakespeare wrote mostly tragedies, and from about 1608 to 1613, mainly tragicomedies called romances. The first recorded works of Shakespeare are Richard III and the three parts of Henry VI, written in the early 1590s during the vogue for historical drama. Shakespeare's plays are difficult to date, however, and studies of the texts suggest that Titus Andronicus, The Comedy of Errors, The Taming of the Shrew, and Two Gentlemen of Verona may also belong to Shakespeare's earliest period. His first histories, which draw heavily on the 1587 edition of Raphael Hollinshead's Chronicles of England, Scotland and Ireland, dramatise the destructive results of weak or corrupt rule, and have been interpreted as a justification for the origins of the Tudor dynasty. Their composition was influenced by the works of other Elizabethan dramatists, especially Thomas Kidd and Christopher Marlowe, by the traditions of medieval drama, and by the plays of Seneca. The Comedy of Errors was also based on classical models, but no source for the taming of the shrew has been found, though it is related to a separate play of the same name, and may have derived from a folk story. Like Two Gentlemen of Verona, in which two friends appear to approve of rape, the shrew's story of the taming of a woman's independent spirit by a man sometimes troubles modern critics and directors. Shakespeare's early classical and Italianate comedies, containing tight double plots and precise comic sequences, give way in the mid-1590s to the romantic atmosphere of his greatest comedies. A Midsummer Night's Dream is a witty mixture of romance, fairy magic, and comic low-life scenes. Shakespeare's next comedy, 
the equally romantic The Merchant of Venice, contains a portrayal of the vengeful Jewish moneylender Shylock, which reflected Elizabethan views, but may appear racist to modern audiences. The wit and wordplay of Much Ado About Nothing, the charming rural setting of As You Like It, and the lively merrymaking of Twelfth Night complete Shakespeare's sequence of great comedies. After the lyrical Richard II, written almost entirely in verse, Shakespeare introduced prose comedy into the histories of the late 1590s, Henry IV, parts 1 and 2, and Henry V. His characters become more complex and tender as he switches deftly between comic and serious scenes, prose and poetry, and achieves the narrative variety of his mature work. This period begins and ends with two tragedies, Romeo and Juliet, the famous romantic tragedy of sexually charged adolescence, love and death, and Julius Caesar, based on Sir Thomas North's 1579 translation of Plutarch's Parallel Lives, which introduced a new kind of drama. According to Shakespearean scholar James Shapiro, in Julius Caesar, the various strands of politics, character, inwardness, contemporary events, even Shakespeare's own reflections on the act of writing, began to infuse each other. Shakespeare's so-called tragic period lasted from about 1600 to 1608, though he also wrote the so-called problem plays Measure for Measure, Troilus and Cressida, and All's Well That Ends Well during this time, and had written tragedies before. Many critics believe that Shakespeare's greatest tragedies represent the peak of his art. The hero of the first, Hamlet, has probably been more discussed than any other Shakespearean character, especially for his famous soliloquy, to be or not to be, that is the question. Unlike the introverted Hamlet, whose fatal flaw is hesitation, the heroes of the tragedies that followed, Othello and King Lear, are undone by hasty errors of judgment. The plots of Shakespeare's tragedies often hinge on such fatal errors or flaws, which overturn order and destroy the hero and those he loves. In Othello, the villain, Iago, stokes Othello's sexual jealousy to the point where he murders the innocent wife who loves him. In King Lear, the old king commits the tragic error of giving up his powers, triggering scenes which lead to the murder of his daughter and the torture and blinding of the Duke of Gloucester. According to the critic Frank Commode, the play offers neither its good characters nor its audience any relief from its cruelty. In Macbeth, the shortest and most compressed of Shakespeare's tragedies, uncontrollable ambition incites Macbeth and his wife, Lady Macbeth, to murder the rightful king and usurp the throne, until their own guilt destroys them in turn. In this play, Shakespeare adds a supernatural element to the tragic structure. His last major tragedies, Antony and Cleopatra and Coriolanus, contain some of Shakespeare's finest poetry, and were considered his most successful tragedies by the poet and critic T.S. Eliot. In his final period, Shakespeare turned to romance or tragicomedy, and completed three more major plays, Cymbeline, The Winter's Tale, and The Tempest, as well as the collaboration Pericles, Prince of Tyre. Less bleak than the tragedies, these four plays are graver in tone than the comedies of the 1590s, but they end with reconciliation and the forgiveness of potentially tragic errors. Some commentators have seen this change in mood as evidence of a more serene view of life on Shakespeare's part, but it may merely reflect the theatrical fashion of the day. Shakespeare collaborated on two further surviving plays, Henry VIII and The Two Noble Kinsmen, probably with John Fletcher. Performances See also the main article entitled Shakespeare in Performance. It is not clear for which companies Shakespeare wrote his early plays. The title page of the 1594 edition of Titus Andronicus reveals that the play had been acted by three different troops. After the plagues of 1592 to 1593, Shakespeare's plays were performed by his own company at the Theatre and the Curtain in Shoreditch, north of the Thames. Londoners flocked there to see the first part of Henry IV, Leonard Diggs recording, Let but false stuff come, Howl, Poins, the rest, and you scarce shall have a room. When the company found themselves in dispute with their landlord, they pulled the theatre down and used the timbers to construct the Globe Theatre the first playhouse built by actors for actors, on the south bank of the Thames at Southwark. The Globe opened in autumn 1599, with Julius Caesar, one of the first plays staged. 
most of Shakespeare's greatest post-1599 plays were written for the Globe, including Hamlet, Othello and King Lear. After the Lord Chamberlain's men were renamed the King's Men in 1603, they entered a special relationship with the new King James. Although the performance records are patchy, the King's Men performed seven of Shakespeare's plays at court between the 1st of November 1604 and the 31st of October 1605, including two performances of The Merchant of Venice. After 1608, they performed at the Indoor Blackfriars Theatre during the winter and the Globe during the summer. The indoor setting, combined with the Jacobean fashion for lavishly staged masks, allowed Shakespeare to introduce more elaborate stage devices. In Cymbeline, for example, Jupiter descends in thunder and lightning, sitting upon an eagle. He throws a thunderbolt. The ghosts fall on their knees. The actors in Shakespeare's company included the famous Richard Burbage, William Kemp, Henry Condell and John Heminges. Burbage played the leading role in the first performances of many of Shakespeare's plays, including Richard III, Hamlet, Othello and King Lear. The popular comic actor Will Kemp played the servant Peter in Romeo and Juliet, and Dogbury in Much Ado About Nothing, among other characters. He was replaced around the turn of the 16th century by Robert Armin, who played roles such as Touchstone in As You Like It and The Fool in King Lear. In 1613, Sir Henry Wotton recorded that Henry VIII was set forth with many extraordinary circumstances of pomp and ceremony. On the 29th of June, however, a cannon set fire to the thatch of the globe and burned the theatre to the ground, an event which pinpoints the date of a Shakespeare play with rare precision. Textual Sources In 1623, John Heminges and Henry Condell two of Shakespeare's friends from The King's Men, published the first folio, a collected edition of Shakespeare's plays. It contains 36 texts, including 18 printed for the first time. Many of the plays had already appeared in quarto versions, flimsy books made from sheets of paper folded twice to make four leaves. No evidence suggests that Shakespeare approved these editions, which the first folio describes as stolen and surreptitious copies. Alfred Pollard termed some of them bad quartos because of their adapted, paraphrased or garbled texts, which may, in places, have been reconstructed from memory. Where several versions of a play survive, each differs from the other. The differences may stem from copying or printing errors, from notes by actors or audience members, or from Shakespeare's own papers. In some cases, for example Hamlet, Troilus and Cressida, and Othello, Shakespeare could have revised texts between the quarto and folio editions. The folio version of King Lear is so different from the 1608 quarto that the Oxford Shakespeare prints them both, since they cannot be conflated without confusion. Section 3. Poems In 1593 and 1594, when the theatres were closed because of plague, Shakespeare published two narrative poems on erotic themes, Venus and Adonis, and The Rape of Lucrece. He dedicated them to Henry Risley, Earl of Southampton. In Venus and Adonis, an innocent Adonis rejects the sexual advances of Venus, while in The Rape of Lucrece, the virtuous wife Lucrece is raped by the lustful Tarquin. Influenced by Ovid's Metamorphoses, the poems show the guilt and moral confusion that result from uncontrolled lust. Both proved popular and were often reprinted during Shakespeare's lifetime. A third narrative poem, A Lover's Complaint, in which a young woman laments her seduction by a persuasive suitor, was printed in the first edition of the Sonnets in 1609. Most scholars now accept that Shakespeare wrote A Lover's Complaint. Critics consider that its fine qualities are marred by leaden effects. The Phoenix and the Turtle, printed in Robert Chester's 1601 Love's Martyr, mourns the death of the legendary phoenix and his lover, the faithful turtle dove. In 1599, two early drafts of sonnets 138 and 144 appeared in The Passionate Pilgrim, published under Shakespeare's name, but without his permission. Sonnets See also the main article entitled Shakespeare's Sonnets. Published in 1609, the sonnets were the last of Shakespeare's non-dramatic works to be printed. 
Scholars are not certain when each of the 154 sonnets was composed, but evidence suggests that Shakespeare wrote sonnets throughout his career for a private readership. Even before the two unauthorised sonnets appeared in The Passionate Pilgrim in 1599, Francis Mears had referred in 1598 to Shakespeare's sugared sonnets among his private friends. Few analysts believe that the published collection follows Shakespeare's intended sequence. He seems to have planned two contrasting series, one about uncontrollable lust for a married woman of dark complexion, the Dark Lady, and one about conflicted love for a fair young man, the Fair Youth. It remains unclear if these figures represent real individuals, or if the authorial I who addresses them represents Shakespeare himself, though Wordsworth believed that with the sonnets Shakespeare unlocked his heart. The 1609 edition was dedicated to a Mr. W. H., credited as the only begetter of the poems. It is not known whether this was written by Shakespeare himself or by the publisher, Thomas Thorpe, whose initials appear at the foot of the dedication page, nor is it known who Mr. W. H. was, despite numerous theories, or whether Shakespeare even authorised the publication. Critics praise the sonnets as a profound meditation on the nature of love, sexual passion, procreation, death and time. Section 4. Style See also the main article entitled Shakespeare's Style. Shakespeare's first plays were written in the conventional style of the day. He wrote them in a stylized language that does not always spring naturally from the needs of the characters or the drama. The poetry depends on extended, sometimes elaborate metaphors and conceits, and the language is often rhetorical, written for actors to declaim rather than speak. The grand speeches in Titus Andronicus, in the view of some critics, often hold up the action, for example, and the verse in Two Gentlemen of Verona has been described as stilted. Soon, however, Shakespeare began to adapt the traditional styles to his own purposes. The opening soliloquy of Richard III has its roots in the self-declaration of vice in medieval drama. At the same time, Richard's vivid self-awareness looks forward to the soliloquies of Shakespeare's mature plays. No single play marks a change from the traditional to the freer style. Shakespeare combined the two throughout his career, with Romeo and Juliet perhaps the best example of the mixing of the styles. By the time of Romeo and Juliet, Richard II, and A Midsummer Night's Dream in the mid-1590s, Shakespeare had begun to write a more natural poetry. He increasingly tuned his metaphors and images to the needs of the drama itself. Shakespeare's standard poetic form was blank verse, composed in iambic pentameter. In practice, this meant that his verse was usually unrhymed and consisted of ten syllables to a line, spoken with a stress on every second syllable. The blank verse of his early plays is quite different from that of his later ones. It is often beautiful, but its sentences tend to start, pause and finish at the end of lines, with the risk of monotony. Once Shakespeare mastered traditional blank verse, he began to interrupt and vary its flow. This technique releases the new power and flexibility of the poetry in plays such as Julius Caesar and Hamlet. Shakespeare uses it, for example, to convey the turmoil in Hamlet's mind. Sir, in my heart there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. Methought I lay worse than the mutings in the bilbos. Rashly, and praised be rashness for it, let us know our indiscretion sometimes serves us well. After Hamlet, Shakespeare varied his poetic style further, particularly in the more emotional passages of the late tragedies. The literary critic A. C. Bradley described this style as more concentrated, rapid, varied, and in construction less regular, not seldom twisted or elliptical. In the last phase of his career, Shakespeare adopted many techniques to achieve these effects. These included run-on lines, irregular pauses and stops, and extreme variations in sentence structure and length. In Macbeth, for example, the language darts from one unrelated metaphor or simile to another. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Act 1, scene 7, lines 35 to 38. Pity, like a naked newborn babe, striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air. Act 1, scene 7, lines 21 to 25. The listener is challenged to complete the sense. The late romances, 
with their shifts in time and surprising turns of plot, inspired a last poetic style in which long and short sentences are set against one another, clauses are piled up, subject and object are reversed, and words are omitted, creating an effect of spontaneity. Shakespeare's poetic genius was allied with a practical sense of the theatre. Like all playwrights of the time, Shakespeare dramatised stories from sources such as Petrarch and Hollinshead. He reshaped each plot to create several centres of interest and show as many sides of a narrative to the audience as possible. This strength of design ensures that a Shakespeare play can survive translation, cutting and wide interpretation without loss to its core drama. As Shakespeare's mastery grew, he gave his characters clearer and more varied motivations and distinctive patterns of speech. He preserved aspects of his earlier style in the later plays, however. In his late romances, he deliberately returned to a more artificial style, which emphasised the illusion of theatre. Section 5. Influence See also the main article entitled Shakespeare's Influence. Shakespeare's work has made a lasting impression on later theatre and literature. In particular, he expanded the dramatic potential of characterization, plot, language and genre. Until Romeo and Juliet, for example, romance had not been viewed as a worthy topic for tragedy. Soliloquies had been used mainly to convey information about characters or events, but Shakespeare used them to explore characters' minds. His work heavily influenced later poetry. The Romantic poets attempted to revive Shakespearean verse drama, though with little success. Critic George Steiner described all English verse dramas from Coleridge to Tennyson as feeble variations on Shakespearean themes. Shakespeare influenced novelists such as Thomas Hardy, William Faulkner and Charles Dickens. Dickens often quoted Shakespeare, drawing 25 of his titles from Shakespeare's works. The American novelist Herman Melville's soliloquies owe much to Shakespeare. His Captain Ahab in Moby Dick is a classic tragic hero inspired by King Lear. Scholars have identified 20,000 pieces of music linked to Shakespeare's works. These include two operas by Giuseppe Verdi, Otello and Falstaff, whose critical standing compares with that of the source plays. Shakespeare has also inspired many painters, including the Romantics and the Pre-Raphaelites. The Swiss Romantic artist Henry Fuseli, a friend of William Blake, even translated Macbeth into German. The psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud drew on Shakespearean psychology, in particular that of Hamlet, for his theories of human nature. In Shakespeare's day, English grammar and spelling were less standardised than they are now, and his use of language helped shape modern English. Samuel Johnson quoted him more often than any other author in his A Dictionary of the English Language, the first serious work of its type. Expressions such as with bated breath from The Merchant of Venice and a foregone conclusion from Othello have found their way into everyday English speech. Section 6. Critical Reputation See also the main articles entitled Shakespeare's Reputation and Timeline of Shakespeare Criticism. Shakespeare was never revered in his lifetime, but he received his share of praise. In 1598, the cleric and author Francis Mears singled him out from a group of English writers as the most excellent in both comedy and tragedy, and the authors of the Parnassus plays at St John's College, Cambridge, numbered him with Chaucer, Gower and Spencer. In the first folio, Ben Jonson called Shakespeare the soul of the age, the applause, delight, the wonder of our stage, though he had remarked elsewhere that Shakespeare wanted art. Between the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 and the end of the 17th century, classical ideas were in vogue. As a result, critics of the time mostly rated Shakespeare below John Fletcher and Ben Jonson. Thomas Rymer, for example, condemned Shakespeare for mixing the comic with the tragic. Nevertheless, poet and critic John Dryden rated Shakespeare highly, saying of Johnson, I admire him, but I love Shakespeare. For several decades, Rymer's view held sway, but during the 18th century, critics began to respond to Shakespeare on his own terms and acclaim what they termed his natural genius. A series of scholarly editions of his work, notably those of Samuel Johnson in 1765 and Edmund Malone in 1790, added to his growing reputation. By 1800, he was firmly enshrined as the national poet. 
In the 18th and 19th centuries, his reputation also spread abroad. Among those who championed him were the writers Voltaire, Goethe, Stendhal and Victor Hugo. During the Romantic era, Shakespeare was praised by the poet and literary philosopher Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and the critic August Wilhelm Schlegel translated his plays in the spirit of German Romanticism. In the 19th century, critical admiration for Shakespeare's genius often bordered on adulation. That King Shakespeare, the essayist Thomas Carlyle wrote in 1840, does not he shine in crowned sovereignty over us all as the noblest, gentlest, yet strongest of rallying signs, indestructible. The Victorians produced his plays as lavish spectacles on a grand scale. The playwright and critic George Bernard Shaw mocked the cult of Shakespeare worship as bardolatry. He claimed that the new naturalism of Ibsen's plays had made Shakespeare obsolete. The modernist revolution in the arts during the early 20th century, far from discarding Shakespeare, eagerly enlisted his work in the service of the avant-garde. The expressionists in Germany and the futurists in Moscow mounted productions of his plays. Marxist playwright and director Bertolt Brecht devised an epic theatre under the influence of Shakespeare. The poet and critic T.S. Eliot argued against Shaw that Shakespeare's primitiveness, in fact, made him truly modern. Eliot, along with G. Wilson Knight and the School of New Criticism, led a movement towards a closer reading of Shakespeare's imagery. In the 1950s, a wave of new critical approaches replaced modernism and paved the way for postmodern studies of Shakespeare. By the 80s, Shakespeare studies were open to movements such as structuralism, feminism, African-American studies, and queer studies. Section 7. Speculation about Shakespeare. Authorship. See also the main article entitled Shakespeare Authorship Question. Around 150 years after Shakespeare's death, doubts began to emerge about the authorship of Shakespeare's works. Alternative candidates proposed include Francis Bacon, Christopher Marlowe, and Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. Although all alternative candidates are almost universally rejected in academic circles, popular interest in the subject, particularly the Oxfordian theory, has continued into the 21st century. Religion See also the main article entitled Shakespeare's Religion. Some scholars claim that members of Shakespeare's family were Catholics at a time when Catholic practice was against the law. Shakespeare's mother, Mary Arden, certainly came from a pious Catholic family. The strongest evidence might be a Catholic statement of faith signed by John Shakespeare, found in 1757 in the rafters of his former house in Henley Street. The document is now lost, however, and scholars differ on its authenticity. In 1591, the authorities reported that John had missed church for fear of process for debt, a common Catholic excuse. In 1606, William's daughter Susanna was listed among those who failed to attend Easter Communion in Stratford. Scholars find evidence both for and against Shakespeare's Catholicism in his plays, but the truth may be impossible to prove either way. Sexuality See also the main article entitled Sexuality of William Shakespeare. Few details of Shakespeare's sexuality are known. At 18, he married the 26-year-old Anne Hathaway, who was pregnant. Susanna, the first of their three children, was born six months later, on the 26th of May, 1583. However, over the centuries, readers have pointed to Shakespeare's sonnets as evidence of his love for a young man. Others read the same passages as the expression of intense friendship rather than sexual love. At the same time, the 26 so-called Dark Lady sonnets, addressed to a married woman, are taken as evidence of heterosexual liaisons. Section 8. List of Works For further information, see the list entitled List of Shakespeare's Works, and the article entitled Chronology of Shakespeare Plays. Classification of the Plays Shakespeare's works include the 36 plays printed in the first folio of 1623, listed here according to their folio classification as comedies, histories, and tragedies. Shakespeare did not write every word of the plays attributed to him, and several show signs of collaboration, a common practice at the time. Two plays not included in the first folio, 
the two noble kinsmen and Pericles, Prince of Tyre, are now accepted as part of the canon, with scholars agreed that Shakespeare made a major contribution to their composition. No poems were included in the first folio. In the late 19th century, Edward Dowden classified four of the late comedies as romances, and though many scholars prefer to call them tragic comedies, his term is often used. These plays, and the associated two noble kinsmen, are identified in the list. In 1896, Frederick S. Boas coined the term problem plays to describe four plays, All's Well That Ends Well, Measure for Measure, Troilus and Cressida, and Hamlet. Dramas as singular in theme and temper cannot be strictly called comedies or tragedies, he wrote. We may therefore borrow a convenient phrase from the theatre of today and class them together as Shakespeare's problem plays. The term, much debated and sometimes applied to other plays, remains in use, though Hamlet is definitively classed as a tragedy. The other problem plays are identified in the list. Plays thought to be only partly written by Shakespeare are also identified. Other works occasionally attributed to him are listed as lost plays or apocrypha. Comedies. See also the main article entitled Shakespearean Comedy. All's Well That Ends Well, also identified as a problem play. As You Like It. The Comedy of Errors. Love's Labour's Lost. Measure for Measure, also identified as a problem play. The Merchant of Venice. The Merry Wives of Windsor. A Midsummer Night's Dream. Much Ado About Nothing. Pericles, Prince of Tyre, also identified as a romance, and only partly written by Shakespeare. The Taming of the Shrew. The Tempest, also identified as a romance. Twelfth Night, or What You Will. The Two Gentlemen of Verona. The Two Noble Kinsmen, also identified as a romance, and only partly written by Shakespeare. The Winter's Tale, also identified as a romance. Histories. See also the main article entitled Shakespearean Histories. King John. Richard II. Henry IV, Part 1. Henry IV, Part 2. Henry V. Henry VI, Part 1 only partly written by Shakespeare. Henry VI, Part Two. Henry VI, Part Three. Richard III. Henry VIII, only partly written by Shakespeare. Tragedies. See also the main article entitled Shakespearean Tragedy. Romeo and Juliet. Coriolanus. Titus Andronicus only partly written by Shakespeare. Timon of Athens, only partly written by Shakespeare. Julius Caesar. Macbeth, only partly written by Shakespeare. Hamlet. Troilus and Cressida, also described as a problem play. King Lear. Othello. Antony and Cleopatra. Cymbeline also identified as a romance. Poems. Shakespeare's Sonnets. Venus and Adonis. The Rape of Lucrece. The Passionate Pilgrim. The Phoenix and the Turtle. A Lover's Complaint. Lost Plays. Love's Labour's Won. Cardinio, only partly written by Shakespeare. Apocrypha. See also the main article entitled Shakespeare Apocrypha. Arden of Faversham. The Birth of Merlin. Locrini. The London Prodigal. The Puritan. The Second Maiden's Tragedy. Sir John Oldcastle, 
Thomas Lord Cromwell. A Yorkshire Tragedy. Edward III. Sir Thomas More. Notes to the Works. Many scholars believe that Pericles was co-written with George Wilkins. The Two Noble Kinsmen was co-written with John Fletcher. Henry VI Part I is often thought to be the work of a group of collaborators, but some scholars, for example Michael Hathaway, believe the play was wholly written by Shakespeare. Henry VIII was co-written with John Fletcher. Brian Vickers suggests that Titus Andronicus was co-written with George Peel, though Jonathan Bate, the play's most recent editor for the Arden Shakespeare, believes it to be wholly the work of Shakespeare. Brian Vickers and others believe that Timon of Athens was co-written with Thomas Middleton, though some commentators disagree. The text of Macbeth which survives has plainly been altered by later hands. Most notable is the inclusion of two songs from Thomas Middleton's play The Witch of 1615. The Passionate Pilgrim, published under Shakespeare's name in 1599 without his permission, includes early versions of two of his sonnets, three extracts from Love's Labours Lost, several poems known to be by other poets, and eleven poems of unknown authorship, for which the attribution to Shakespeare has not been disproved. Cardinio was apparently co-written with John Fletcher. Further reading. Shakespeare's Lives by S. Schoenbaum, published 1991 by Oxford University Press. Will in the World, How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare, by Stephen Greenblatt, published 2005 by Pimlico. Shakespeare, A Life, by Park Honan, published 1998 by Oxford University Press. The Oxford Shakespeare, The Complete Works, Second Edition, by Stanley Wells et al., published 2005 by Oxford University Press. The Art of Shakespeare's Sonnets, by Helen Vendler, published 1997 by Harvard University Press.